so talk to us right now. What is a typical like day in your life? I, I really want to I, I want to dive into your to your business. I want to hear about your training and et cetera. Fill us in. You know what? It's actually evolving as we go because uh, you know I went from being the trainer on the floor to now uh, the coach of the coaches. Um, so a lot of my time is actually consulting and helping teams uh, right from Major League Baseball to NFL quarterbacks, like across the board, different sports and different athletics uh, where they're looking for new ways to uh, to train their athletes and get get the results without going down that traditional strength and conditioning route. Um, so I'm consulting a lot. Um, I do still work with athletes uh, like on the road, obviously. Uh, I have to travel to my athletes, which takes up a lot of time. But in my home gym, uh, we have a junior program. And I just love working with those high school age kids mm. and uh, helping them develop into not just better athletes, but better people. So what was the last... Um the last person, if you can mention them, and I know that sometimes that can be tricky, but the last person and the last thing that you worked on with them, was it something that was specific that you were brought in for, or was it something that you noticed while you were there? Yeah, usually when I'm brought in as a consultant, it's usually because they've gone down that traditional route. Um, either the person has lost a little bit of speed, they've lost a little bit of zip. Let's say, like I worked with a, a quarterback who had lost their throw, if you will. And, uh, and so they, they realized that, no matter, it wasn't a technique issue. There was a lot going on with the body and they were starting to get overuse injuries in weird spots too, like in the big toe, uh, hmm. lead leg, knee, um, some impingement issues in the shoulder. And they're like, this is just not normal. So when I went in and did some screening and looked at like really what, how the athlete was moving, I found these big energy leaks where they were just like losing energy in certain, certain positions. And so we just had to get the right muscles to fire, doing some muscle activation stuff, get the right muscles to fire, get the rotational slings to really connect, get their nervous system to buy into it. And all of a sudden we started getting that zip back. Um, and I used to play football and it was really cool to be able to like with an NFL quarterback, be able to catch balls for, hmm. you know, half an hour when he just kept saying, let me throw another one. Let me throw another. That feels so good. I feel like I'm in college again. Because we have limited time and we want to um, cover a ton of ground with you. And I feel like we now that we have uh, a background, we did a little warm up. We know we know each other. Uh, and so does the audience. We're going to spin the wheel. The the, dun, dun. the whirl of fun, as it's called. The uh, wheel of fun. No, whirl of oh, fun. Oh, this sounds fun. <laughs> we're going to do five spins. And it's going to correspond to a, a different topic or question. And we're going to let you take it away. The whirl of fun. The whirl of fun, right? <laughs> I'm just going to keep saying that in the back. So Don's going to go ahead and. He talks a little. Yeah, the maybe we'll get four. Go for it. Ready? Don. Yeah. We can't hear anything. Oh, that's technology right there. Yeah. Oh, you can see it on your screen? I can see it. That looks great. It's awesome. Learn me new stuff. So basically, can you explain to me, and uh, I know you can because it was on your website and I want to know more about it, the importance of disassociation for rotational training. Rotational sports, everybody focuses on disassociation, like the, the separate your upper body from a stable lower body or being able to have an upper body that's stable while your lower body like leads into whatever motion it is, be it throws or, or striking an implement. Um, but when training disassociation, a lot of people focus on like trying to get the body to maximize rotation or change like the difference between their shoulders and their hips to maximize that, that differential. But in reality, the best way that I feel we get those results is by actually doing the opposite. We work on anti-rotation training. We work on resisting train, uh, rotation. Once we have the nervous system and the uh, motor pattern down that you can effectively rotate without any compensations, when we train the braking system, which is you know resisting disassociation, I feel like once we've established that, then training for speed in rotation becomes easier. Right. What a long, strange trip. Ooh. What travel strategies do you suggest to pro athletes to ensure that they're ready to roll when they step off the plane or motorboat or Vespa or whatever they used to travel? I have a couple of strategies. In fact, I have uh, two players right now playing uh, on the PGA Tour in, in Japan. It's the first uh, year that they've ever had a tournament in Japan. So we're dealing with jet lag. We're dealing with uh, long flights. My my general uh, take is that um, if you got to get on their time zone right away. So even if you're just flying from L.A. to New York or vice versa, as soon as you get on the plane, you got to put your clock to their time zone. And then you have to decide at that point, looking at the clock in their time zone, do you want to be sleeping on the plane or do you want to stay awake on the plane? 
If you want to sleep on the plane, I like them to eat carbohydrates, simple carbohydrates that are going to kind of give them a bit of a sugar spike. They're going to crash and fall asleep. Now, that could be a glass of wine and it could be a, uh, you know, a, a protein bar that has a you know, high sugar carbohydrate content. But if we want to stay awake during that time, and normally they'd be sleeping, but now we want them to be awake, then we have high protein, high fat, no carbohydrates, no alcohol, no nothing, and then try and stay awake for that period of time. And then once they arrive in their destination, they got to do something active and they got to move their body and kind of flush out all that, uh, all that bad waste. flight, yeah, uh, waste. you know, not moving for, for, you know, anywhere from if you're going cross country five hours, but, uh, across the, across the pond, it could be anywhere of uh, 13 to 14 hours. Do you make that same recommendation for people who are not traveling to play sports? So say if the, you have a client going over to London for two days, are you immediately trying to change their clock when they get on the plane or are you telling them stay on New York time? So you don't come back. You don't feel like Uh, crap. That's a great point. Um, Don, I just got back from Korea uh, last uh, two weeks ago. And then I have to go back to China in three weeks from now. And I'm only there for three days at a time. (laughs) Yeah. What are you going to do? So during those three days, I just stay on my clock. And I say to myself, I go, and and I learned this from Liam Hennessy, great uh, strength coach from Ireland. And he deals with all their national teams, rugby teams that travel around the world. He basically said, don't change your time zone unless you're going to be there for five to like five plus days, seven days. Because what he said was, all you got to do is you need to get up and be ready for battle when the time comes for you to execute what you're there for. So if you're there to execute for a game that lasts, you know, let's say prep, game post game is like four hours total then you just got to get up and be ready for that so if you have to sleep and it's seven o'clock at night but you're sleeping till four in the afternoon and then you get up and start that process that's fine but if you do that and you play golf for five hours and you have two hours before and an hour afterwards you better get on their time zone pretty quick because you're going to be there for a week let's take it it. that's you it's me What do we got? Oh, retire this immediately. Oh, yeah, I already know what he's going to say. Yeah, Go okay. On. So you got to choose something. <laughs> you know exactly what I'm going to say. It could they be exercise, more than one because I know what you're going to say. Exercise, food, training style, styrofoam, anything you want. What's something that you'll, you want to retire right now? Yeah, you know what? There's two things that I want to retire right now. One would be the bench press. That and the coming. second one would be back squats. And this, this will anger people who, you know, are strength, strength trainers mm-hmm. um, because they are like the absolute like pinnacles of, of strength testing. We use bench press and, and back squat for strength testing. My, my opinion is, is this, is that if we're training athletes, I think you need to have your feet on the ground. I think you need to be able to push from the ground, utilize every muscle in your body in a push or pull uh, movement pattern. So. Uh, the bench press just takes that away by using the bench as a stabilizer. Obviously, you're going to have a retort because, mm. you know, we, we've had this conversation before where, you know, I, I just believe that, like, watching Don back squat, fantastic. He has perfect form. Poetry but in I motion. Just, like, most of my clients, the front squat, it makes them stand a little taller, T-spine extension. It makes them stand up a little taller and have better technique and better form. And because I train with the mindset that we don't have to get heavier, 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 instead we have to get move better, move better, move better, the front squat, I can load them with enough weight and have them get the strength gains that they want without having to put it on their back. You know what's ironic uh, about you? You know what's uh, you know what's ironic about this? Ask me how many people do you think I, I have back squat? How Probably many people many. do you think? No, uh, how many that's people not even right. Squat? None. I haven't back squatted a client in years. I may have. You will. But I will. And, you have great form. Well, yeah. But I mean, I mean, I've got, I've got good form. The but best. There's, but there's still restriction in my ankles. Like I've been elevating my heels slightly. There's specific things that allow me to take the parking brake off, and I, and I feel like I can move a lot better. But am I getting almost the same stimulation? I mean, a double kettlebell squat. When you have double 36s or double 40s in here, take a guy with a, a 500 pound squat and have him do that and see if he can do it. It's exactly. they're very they're very comparable. I agree with him 100 percent, and I do movements like that because one, I love doing them. Two, I still find that and I still front squat a lot. I still do zerchers. I do Frankenstein squats. There's variations of squats, but do I have most people out there back squat? The answer is no, because he's 100 percent right. They almost and it's a terrible line to say, but they haven't earned the right to even try to attempt that because they can't get into that position. And there's other things that they're able to do. Put them into a split stance. 
Honestly, I think I think a split squat or a real front elevated split squat or two or a one-legged squat to a box are two of the most overlooked movements in lower body training. A one-legged oh, RDL, you know fantastic. What? We no, you, that's a great point. And, you know, Mike Boyle, a mentor of ours and a, and a good friend, uh, Mike Boyle came out with the rear leg elevated uh, split squat. I mean, I'm not saying that he invented it. I'm just saying that he made a big point. It's brutal. He had a whole hour lecture at Perform Better on why this was a better movement than a back squat. And when he said it, I couldn't believe that the audience was angered. And they were just like, this is not true. This is Because they're like, all doing it. Exactly. Yeah. That's why, yeah, you know. And now everybody does it. Why is it so divisive? Is it because people like doing it? Or is it that the research is conflicted? Or they believe certain research that... It, I, I'm just curious as to why people have that um, uh, emotional response. Because it's not yeah, bad for know, everyone, you know. It's... You're, you know, but you're absolutely right, though. All the standardized testing is all based on a back squat and a bench press. Um, when, when I send an athlete to div Division One school for athletics, the first thing they do is they go, I got to get ready for the combine and I got to get ready for the back squat and the, the bench press. And I don't train that way. So it's really hard for me. I'm like conflicted because I'm, I'm trying to get them to test better instead of being a better athlete. And that's a conflict for me. So I'm like, oh, we're going to have to take three steps backwards as an athlete to put you five steps forward in those two tests. But then when you get on the field, you're not, you're going to be not moving the way we want you to. So it's, it, you know, it, but it's the, it's the facts. That's how they test them. It's the gold standard. We got two more. Good. I love so it. I can go. keep talking to him. He's easy. <laughs> He's fun. All right. Ooh. Overrated, underrated. I'm going to list a handful of stuff and All right. you're going to let me know if you think it's overrated or underrated. Just as I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Says it right there. Okay, go. Lifting for PR. Ah, overrated. Why is that? Um, at TPI, we believe that uh, most athletes can't uh, do a, a, like a maximum rep because of the, like the risk risk reward. Um, so we use what's called a perceived eight rep max. And what we find is we can get pretty close because we test athletes that you know that do lift. <laughs> And when we do their perceived eight rep max, and then we calibrate it to their max rep, we find that it's very, very close. So we're like, why, why go there with the one rep and potentially tear something or, 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 you know, ruin the athlete when we can do a perceived eight rep max and be safe. What's my opinion on yeah. that? Um, for general pop and for athletes, I agree with them hundred yeah. percent. It's just, what is the reward you're getting out of taking someone to a true one RM? The risk is going to outweigh it tenfold. Plant-based diets. Uh, there's a good one. I actually love the plant-based diet and uh, I believe in it. I just don't follow it. Right. Um, I like to think of myself as like an ova pescatarian almost. Um, I eat predominantly fish uh, eggs and then plants. But if we, you know, if you go to grandma's and she's having a, a roast, I'm eating a roast. And, uh, if I go out with the boys and we're watching a football game and the, the wings come, I'm eating the wings. Right. So I just, I just think like predominantly, like maybe 80% of my week is going to be, uh, fish and vegetables. Uh, but I also live on the West coast in Vancouver, British Columbia. We got great fish and, uh, a ton of sushi and stuff like that. So but you're really plant strong. I'm plant strong. I guess so. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, and more, but you still haven't answered it overrated or underrated. I, th I think it's underrated yeah, because I think we're all going to learn that uh, <laughs> we, need to increase, we need to increase the uh, the the plants in our diet. What's you got the, me again, did you, Don? No, I, no, I blew that one. I thought you were going to say it was overrated. Yes. Uh, before, before I ask Don, <laughs> what's, uh, what's your NFL team? Which one do you follow? Uh, Seahawks. All right. Yeah, Northwest. Northwest. Gotcha. Absolutely. And I'm talking way back in the day when like Dave Craig was the quarterback and he led the league in most fumbles uh, and in actually in the history, he has the, the most fumbles in the, in the history of the NFL, He's a record uh, holder. Brian blades, all that, that back in that era, just at Steve Largent, that was, and now we have success, you know, and people are like, Oh, bandwagon, bandwagon. I'm like, yeah. eh. It's no bad way. <laughs> I just uh, right from right from the start. I know. I feel like I know where you stand on this because what, uh, on plant based. Well, no, yeah. I, I I don't know if you I don't know if you do though. When you say plant based, I was just under the assumption that he was saying no animal protein at all whatsoever. And I do believe that as a society, we are not getting enough high quality plants in. And I almost feel like everyone should be getting more. So in a way, I almost think it's it's 
underrated, but I'm, I'm not against, like, I, I want people to get animal protein in there. That's just my, that's my opinion. Yeah, I and mean, here's the other thing. I know that that, um, that study or that, I don't even know, maybe it was a meta-analysis of, um, you know, what meat does to you and how often you should eat oh, what, it. Oh, that came crappy out China study? Yeah, yeah and yeah, then yeah. it came out, but it came out again. <laughs> but it seemed What'd like I say? I'm sorry. everybody was, like, <laughs> looking to pounce on that. Like, oh, Bob, you know, like, I told you it's bullshit. Like, you could eat red meat all day long, and it's like... Look, I don't look. I really here's the thing. But now, according to the New York Times, yeah. they're saying that animal protein's good. So it's like you know. Well, that's come the on. thing. You know, it's it's like, like my thing was, well, why don't you just continue with what you're doing? I mean, most people. I guess when I when I was reading about it and trying to get some clarity from it, it was pretty much the same thing. Like, you know, don't just don't overdo anything. The Smith machine. The Smith machine. Hmm. Um, Going back to my uh, to how I became a trainer without equipment, the Smith machine was never an option for me. Like I literally just didn't have it in my gym, never used it. Uh, I used it a little bit back when I was a running back in college, um, but but after that, I, it basically became like a Betamax. Uh, <laughs> it just became an archaic piece of equipment in the in. So I don't use it. I don't prescribe it, uh, and it just became something that's in the corner of the gym. Um, yeah, I'm going to say overrated. Let's skip this one because we he's already shit all over the bench press enough. So, yeah. like... Uh, nah, yeah, 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 we're out. We're going to yeah. go one we, more. We, we know he hates that one. Yeah. Okay, Ooh, I'm glad we got this one. Okay, that's good. All right, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So, <laughs> name someone that is doing something good for the industry. Name someone that is doing something bad for the industry. And then, name the most common exercise that you see people doing with ugly-ass form. Something good? Yeah. Yeah. Name somebody who is doing something good that you, somebody that you either follow or have recognized or that recently were, you know, just impressed with, or, you know, somebody that's made an impression on you. You know what? Uh, I'm, I'm going to throw out a name, uh, Donald Noam. Um, Many, many people out there might not, but I think he's an up and coming uh, strength coach, but really an influencer in the industry. And that is Frank Nash out mm -hmm. of uh, Boston. Uh, the reason why I love Frank is I've, I've known Frank for years and he's uh, he's opened up gyms called uh, Stronger. Mm -hmm. I think it's I think it's just called Stronger. Anyways, the, if you follow him on Instagram, Frank Nash, uh, what you'd see is he's bringing like the energy of a nightclub into his fitness facilities and he's adding so much energy and personality to everything that he does but with good training yeah with good with good quality yeah. training too and good business acumen um so i just feel like he's really like changing put it this way people people in fitness like the clients that come to see us they come to see us because they don't like fitness hmm. if they loved fitness they'd be like us they just train on their own but because they don't like fitness, they need somebody that's going to motivate them and kind of get them really fired up about something that they already hate. Mm -hmm. So I think that he's doing a great job of making fitness fun, and we need more people like him in the industry. Is someone good, you know, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to throw one of our buddies out there right now, and I'm, I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to throw my buddy Rob Yang out there, who's a who's a nutritionist. And what I love, he's he's almost coined this phrase recently: "Your BFF is your PFF." So your best friend forever is protein, fat, fiber. And what I'm finding out with people who are binging in the evening or they can't um, keep it together in the evening and they become emotional eaters is because they are not maintaining their blood sugar level. And for me in weight loss, I think it's really simple. Maintain your blood sugar level and you become active and things are going to happen. And that's without measuring macros or diving in and doing some crazy training program. But for the people out there who are struggling to take weight off because they are emotional eaters, you make your BFF, your PFF, and you've eliminated that problem. Because if you have a, a well-balanced diet, you're not going to be craving junk. I'm going to name this guy right here. Thank you. I, I mean it. Aww. And, and, here, and, I'm, and here's why. Uh, Don, is, uh, Don has done a really, really good job of trying to um, help me turn things around here. He's really like uh, brought in a ton of amazing guests and sources like yourself. Mm -hmm. And it has been such a huge help to... What, you know, and I, what we're trying to do not not just with this podcaster, uh, but with the, the the publication overall. So I got to say, like, I really, you know, he puts in a lot of, uh, you know, we talk a lot, we text a lot, and, yeah. and he's always trying to find uh, a new guest. So uh, 
Thank yeah, you man. for that. So, no, so thank but you. I think, really. I think our mission is simple. Our mission is just to help people, is to help educate people with good quality content. I think it's that simple, and whatever else happens, happens. So. Yeah, but it's like, awesome. you know, thank you. You know, I, I'm, I get pulled away a lot, I get strapped a lot, sure. and you're. You, it, we wouldn't have guests right now thank you, if no. it weren't for you. I appreciate that. So thank you. Great. So now, let's talk about some shitty people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> who's yeah. somebody that's that's either a hurdle or, or, or being detrimental to people's uh, education or just uh, their psyche or something? Like, what is something that you've noticed, or maybe it's a trend, but you know, what is it that's uh, that, that you've seen? I feel like there are people out there that come across as fitness experts, and they're strictly just hot. Yeah. Um, so, and Don is one of the very unique people that has the ability to, you know, have a post with a shirt off, but then back it up with the knowledge that, and knowing what it takes to get there. Thank you. Yeah. Where some of the other people they're, they're, they're being followed for their fitness expertise, but there's really no substance behind it. Yeah. It, all there is, is that they have a flat stomach or they, uh, they have a nice booty. So yeah. that, that right there, I think is, is causing the average person that watches, uh, you know, like the average Joe who will never have that body and, and really not the time and the effort that it takes and the knowledge it takes to get there. I feel like it gives them a disservice and it, it makes them feel horrible about themselves because they can't uh, live up to that expectation. That's it. And I think That's it's brilliant. also like, uh, I think it's actually the, the opposite of what you say. I think they follow them because they're hot and then they say, oh shit, you're an expert and they're not. And that's right. been the problem, and, and we discuss it uh, ad nauseum, and it's a, it's annoying because I'm sure, like as a coach too, you have to undo a lot of what people feel like they know is right from what they've seen, and that's got to be frustrating. I used to read Muscle and, and Fitness magazine way back when I was training for for <clears throat> you know college athletics and back in high school, and I used to always love read like seeing the pictures motivated me. So there is something to that. Seeing those bodybuilders with these perfect physiques, it motivated me, and I'd put those posters in my gym to give me that motivation. Great, but then. You also had an article that showed me how to do it and how to do it safely. That is very different than showing me a hot picture right. and then somebody going on and going, well, all you got to do is just do live like me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good morning. I get my coffee. I drink, you know. No, it's coffee, 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 coffee. No, and, coffee. and that's it. And like that's you know that that's and hey, but that's that's great that that and we do try to still do that with um, you know aspirational uh, physiques and things like that. But there's there's more to it, and we're still trying to cover all that ground. And I think that that's you know that that's a really I don't know just a good point that that he's making. That is, it's okay to to have these aspirational figures, but. It's how do you get there, and that's what we're always trying to do here is give people the information that can get them from A to B safely, and guess what the shitty part is? They also have to understand that it's not going to happen overnight. What bothers you in the industry? It, it, it can be very clickish. You know, people it, it just really, like, they're, whatever they're doing is the best. What you're doing sucks. I don't care what you do. Uh, if you like doing it, great. But I mean, like, you know, I know Don, you know, as a coach, he watches group fitness and I know he cringes a lot. And I understand that because he's seeing people that aren't getting the attention that they may need. And this is something that we've discussed. I've taken group fitness classes when I've needed motivation and joining a group has helped me. Right. And it's also introduced me to some very good people. So I see value in it sometimes. Um, I enjoy it, but I don't do it a ton. But, um, you know, when people are like, well, group fitness sucks. It's like, okay, so don't do it. <laughs> you know, listen, I, I just think there's a better way of doing things. And, and the problem that I have is, you know, we take our profession very seriously. And when a club promoter in New York City is just like, you know what, let's get a bunch of hot women, let's throw them in a class, mm -hmm. let's turn the temperature up to 110 degrees, though I understand that might be a, motiv a motivating factor for most, the general population, they don't really know the difference. They don't really know how to uh, 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 differentiate success and failure. They, they're always saying, well, I, I sweat, so it's successful. And then they're coming into you six months later going, my back's killing me, my hip's killing me, my shoulder's killing me. And that, to me, is unfair. I'm almost embarrassed to say this, but I just uh, finished my one-year hot yoga -versity. Oh, I love my, it. my anniversary of doing hot yoga for an entire year and it's a group setting and right. it's one of the best things I ever did. I love it. And it's because of this good instructor. For the first time in my career, I'm letting someone else lead me mm. in exercise and I am a nobody in the class and I get to sit back and just be the student, which I've never been in my whole career. But here's the deal. 
I look around, I can't help it. I'm a strength coach. I'm looking around, I'm seeing pooping poodles to, and they're, they're teaching squats where the knees aren't allowed to go over the toes. They're teaching deadlifts that are nowhere close to a deadlift. Right, right. So I'm, I know my technique and I'm doing the technique to my best of my abilities. But when I look around me, I'm like going, Oh yeah, these people are getting injured. You're taking notes. For me, this class, this class is fantastic. And it's been great for me, uh, to, to switch it up and be the student again and do something that I wasn't good at. I'm glad that you did hot, hot yoga. I'm, I'm very proud. Oh dude, it's, it's the best. I am so close to touching my, uh, my chakra to my, uh, to my nose. It's oh, I, fantastic. That's, that's my third it. chakra is getting this close. I'm this close right now. <laughs> I love it. What is the ugliest form? You know, when somebody, when you're looking at an exercise and you haven't trained this person, but you're just evaluating, what is the one exercise that you, that you, you know, someone's going to screw up? Do we up? have to name just one? Or no, 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 go for it. No, please. <laughs> yeah. How long do we have? Why don't you start, start off and I'll tell you what I agree with it. This, I, I, I'm going to agree with everything you say, but go, go right ahead. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think the pooping poodle is the, is the absolute worst that, uh, whether it's a deadlift or a squat and they get into that eh, and it feels like, eh, 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 like they're just like round eh, and they're there, you know, you can see the effort. But their back is just so curved and rounded <laughs> instead of that nice, you know, lordotic curve that we're looking for. And I call it the pooping poodle because it seriously looks and they and they kind of <laughs> shuffle their feet a little bit, like as if they're trying to get, you know, when a when a when a a, a puppy eats a string, and they're just saying you you want to pull it, but you can't, you can't because it's it's wrong. <laughs> but they just got to get that ball of string out. That is that position that they get into religiously in my gym for deadlifts and squats. Well, I agree with that. I'm going to add one to it. I, I see not at my gym, but when I go to other gyms, more kettlebell swings just have. Uh, and it's just, whether it's this American swing crap where people are oh, over away, the head, yeah, over, yes. over the head, it's not hard style. They're, they're, they're in a flex position. They're not pushing their hips back. Their knees are, it's becoming a knee dominant movement. It's like everything I've ever been taught about the kettlebell is just, it's like, if you turn to that person and say, do it as wrong as you, if you turn to me and say, do it as wrong as possible, hmm. that's what I feel like these people are doing. So can you quickly, for everybody then explain uh what what the steps should be well i think if someone's if someone's familiar with a good morning which is a really old school movement i think the kettlebell swing and the good morning are two very similar positions i think if you get someone at the bottom position of a good morning or someone at the bottom position of a kettlebell swing i think they're very similar looking now at the top of the swing i like it at about you know i mean listen there's there's you know anywhere from chin to you know chest level. I think you, you can be in this range here. And I think you're trying to create as much tension as possible. When I teach the swing, and I don't know if you agree or disagree, but I teach a hard style swing. Like I'm trying right. to shake the earth and I'm trying to keep as close to possible knee to tibia vertical, even though it's never always there. We're yeah. getting a little forward, forward um, um, push with our knees is completely fine, but that's the sensation I want everyone. I want it as a hip dominant movement. The kettlebell swing has been bastardized um, with these over the head drills that look like you're in a stadium and the oh here it comes here it comes whoa what i can't figure out I, I, I can't figure out what they're they're accomplishing by i'm this. not sure what they're doing either understand. where did it start um, and why is it why did they catch up crossfit they started crossfit i think yeah so. i guess so I, I guess so um i really liked like what you said you know getting the the kettlebell to about shoulder height uh, i like them to have like a little bit of a pulse at the top where they feel like everything's tightening up from you know their legs core glutes tension yeah. chest everything's just being being stabilized and then they're pulling that back through and, and getting that good morning position at the bottom that was fun it was, man. When you're, um, I know you're not in New York much, but when you're in New York, we'd love to have you in the headquarters and do something live. Yeah. And um, could you, um, could you tell everyone listening right now where they can um, contact you, social handles, maybe uh, any products out that you're uh, that you're involved with? Absolutely. Um, you guys can just, if you're on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, anything like that, just go into at Jason Glass Lab. So that's my name, Jason Glass L A B. And uh, and then check out the Coach Glass podcast on uh, Instagram or uh, uh, iTunes or anywhere that you're going to find a uh, find podcast. We are just finished our 311th episode. Uh, we've done it every single Wednesday for 311 weeks without ever missing an episode. So that's over six years of my life dedicated to the that's podcast. Um, and then uh, through that, you're going to find out everything else you need to know about me. Um, and my products like online training programs and all that kind of stuff. So which I would uh, the podcast is where you want to go. I, and I would recommend everyone to listen to Jason because you've got 
thousands of people reaching out to me throughout the year saying, how do I know if I should be following someone on the internet or on social media? And I, it's my line, man. It's our line. I'm sorry. There's influencers and there's coaches. there's coaches. Jason is a true coach that I hold to the highest re regard. So uh, thank you for coming on, brother. Really, it's been an honor thank to know you, you and to watch you do what you've been doing. It really is inspiring. Keep it up. It's a pleasure to meet you. Absolutely. Thank you guys for having me on the show. And uh, yeah, cheers, everybody. All right, awesome. brother. Good luck over there. See you, man. Thanks, Take cheers. Care. Well, okay. This is our 311th uh, episode, right? No, we're way more than that. We're 7, like eight, 000, eight, yeah. 800, and we have uh, missed plenty of weeks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you can get Don at, at Don Saladino. And you can get Zach at ZRAS. And um, reps can, at muscleandfitness.com. Yeah, yeah. You can email us if you want, or you can just comment on social media, or you can go to Don's house. Or you um, just throw shit at Zach's mailbox, yeah, and we'll be fine also. Too. But guys, thanks, <laughs> thanks for joining in, yeah. guys. See you next time. Thanks, man.